I want to talk about Pyron. Um, and the, the goal there is really to go from atomistic structures to full material properties, or as I illustrated here, ideally, f finally, the, the full car. And so we really want to go starting from the full theory level and then compare to experiment at the, at the very end. And we call it integrated development environment because the idea is where to have one solution where you can do all the different steps from setting up your calculation, running them, and aggregating the results. This was one part of my PhD work at the Max Planck Institute für Eisenforschung in Düsseldorf, Germany. And uh, since last year, I'm a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab. So we're now many much fo focusing on the exascale computing efforts there and also more uh, materials under extreme conditions. So what are typical ma uh, materials that we would look at? It would, for example, be the fusion reactors that we now build up um, in the ETAP project, right? So you see the building here. Um, and in this building, you will find the, the core where the fusion is actually happening. And now we, we look at like one specific material part here because we can all imagine that the experiments on that side are very expensive. So what we want to do is really, can we predict these material properties um, from, from the simulation and therefore reduce the number of experiments that we need? So really this, this prediction from simulation, that's the key part here, and starting from the atomistics, right? So the, really doing it up initial without any external inputs from the experiment to build our models. And so there are different properties or features of the uh, material that we consider. So we would start, for example, like if you look at something like corrosion, right? So if you had water or in the case of the, the fusion reactors, right? So we have uh, hydrogen or helium bombardment. We then have like chemical interactions. What kind of material do we have there? We have electronic contributions, vibrational contributions. So this morning we heard about the um, effective harmonic models. So that would be something that could be included here. And then the, obviously the, the coupling of all these different models. And finally, more microscopic parts like the grain boundaries. So as you see it here already, a material science in itself is very quickly getting a, a multi-physics approach, right? So we're maybe not the community that developed most of the codes, but moreover, we, we use codes that were developed in chemistry, like the DFT codes that we heard in the, this morning, or codes from physics. So in particular, if you talk about spin coupling, and then this all ends up in, in codes that are used in material science on a daily basis. And what I personally find so fascinating, or why I think material science in particular nowadays is so interesting, is if we see, look at the agreement that we can get from ab initio in comparison to experimental measurements. So I brought you here the, the heat capacity of calcium. Um, the black dots that you see are all the experimental results. And then what I plot on top of this are two different functionals for DFT. Right? So we don't have to go into the details. What I want to show you here is really that they agree very nice with the lower branch on the, the BCC phase um, of the heat capacity. And just for those who, the heat capacity is basically the number of heat, uh, energy we need to put into a material to heat it up by one uh, unit. And we do this with an adiabatic approach. The important part here is you can now say, okay, this is what obvious. Uh, the experts, so the Calford community, which use this information in like larger scale models, previously tasked with the upper branch, right? So they really had to make this choice, okay, which experiments do we trust? They trusted the upper one. And now, by doing this theoretical prediction and recalculating this, we were able to convince them to update the databases. Right? So we really, that's where we also I had my question about the quantitative agreement. Right? So we will now at this point where we can get quantitative agreement from up initial um, in comparison to experiment. And that's where the, what I find very, very fascinating there. And then how do we get there? So basically we get there by adding the different contributions to the free energy. And just, just very roughly, right? So I would start with the, and the volume curve, so see how the um, material reacts when I compress it. I can then consider effects like electronic temperatures, the phonons, again, these harmonic approximations. And finally, I would use a thermodynamic integration to go from the um, harmonic model to the full uh, unharmonic free energy. If you do this, you would need different kinds of codes, right? So it's for, for the energy volume curve, there would be maybe a simple DFT code. If you go to phonons, you most likely already have a specialized code, which considers the different levels of symmetry. Um, and, and then finally, for the thermodynamic integration, what we will typically do is we run a, a short DFT MD. We fit an interatomic potential, so it could be one of the machine learning potentials that we heard about today. And then finally, do the integration by coupling the machine learning potential directly to DFT. So what you see here basically is, in, in my case, I would use VASP for the first two levels, and I would couple VASP and Phonopy, and then finally VASP with, with LAMPS and MEAMFIT or any other potential fitting code there. So given the hierarchy that we have in materials, we automatically have also a hierarchy in simulation codes. And the challenge, therefore, is how can we couple all them into one consistent simulation protocol? And how can we do it in a way that I can transfer this knowledge 
to the next student and the next person who maybe want to continue on my work. And that was really the motivation why we came up with the Pyron project to really find, can we build like something like an integrated development environment which developers have where all the tools are basically in one place, also for scientists to work with to build simulation protocols. And so now taking one step back, um, we thought again about the, the scientific process and maybe we all can all think about 10 years back, right? So we were using bash scripts, we did maybe some work on our local computers, then we submitted it to the computing cluster and then it was very hard to figure out, okay, what was actually done to get the certain figure in the paper. So what we want is really a solution that covers the whole life cycle, right? So from the idea that I have until I put the, pa uh, paper in, uh, the figure in the paper. And so we started to say, okay, we, we start with a model. The model might be your idea, what you want to validate. You then define specific calculation that you want to do. So this is what we call a project. And this project has generic input. So in our case, it is the, the Python programming language, right? So we have certain Python set what we want to calculate. What then the framework does, and that's all in the, the gray box, is basically it takes the generic input written in the Python programming language, converts it to the code specific input. So this could be a conversion in terms of the units that the simulation code uses, right? So they use a different unit system, particularly to use codes from different communities. They usually have very specific file formats, how the in input has to be provided, and so on. Afterwards, we would execute the simulation. Some simulations you can run on your local computer. Many simulations you want to first transfer the computing cluster. You may want to submit it to, to the queuing system and so on. Right? So it's so handling all the tasks of submitting the calculations and then also aggregating the output and again converting the output from the format of the simulation code to the Python format so that we can work with them. That's what we call then the generic output. By having this generic input and generic output, we can later on iterate over different simulation codes and basically apply the same analysis to different codes um, and therefore simplify the, the development of these kind of analysis models. The job validation, that would, for example, for a DFT code, be just looking at the um, electronic convergence. You can then maybe collect data, so that would be, if I have multiple calculation, analyze them, so it could be a simple fit, for example, for my energy volume curve, and then I would provide the, the visualized result to the user again, so the user can say, okay, does this validate my hypothesis, or do I have to change something, maybe adjust my model, and maybe do another iteration of the simulation lifecycle. So the idea is really covering the whole life cycle and having the, the provenance of what are the steps, what was the thought process when you did this calculation, what was the, the thought process to come up with the final figure in, in a paper. And we implement this uh, based on, on an object-oriented approach, right? So we call them the Pyron objects. All these objects have, are connected to three interfaces. One is the user interface. There we use a bit of, of Python magic, so we use operator overloading. You can add our objects together. We use factoring. So you, from one kind of object, you can create other objects. I will show this in more detail in, in a practical example in a moment. And then these objects are connected to resources, so that would be our specialized DFT codes, the computing cluster, or parameter databases, for example, the, the potential database that we heard about in the last talk. And then finally, um, we are connected to data storage, so that's a, we use HDF5 to store um, large NumPy arrays, um, SQL to store the dependency between the different objects, and it's all implemented in a way that the objects can be serialized, right? So I can save an object in, in, a, in our data format, transfer it to a cluster and reload the object, and I have exactly the same state of the object that I had before. In particular, that's also helpful if you want to do debugging, right? So if the calculation failed on one compute node, it's basically frozen in the HDF5 file, you can reload it, and you get exactly the state that it had before. With this, we try to abstract the technical complexity from the scientific complexity. Because as scientists, we, there's enough struggle with the tech, uh, scientific part, and we don't want to care about the, the technical part of submitting to a cluster, data formats of the file, or the, the parses. So how does it look like for the user? The user commonly uses uh, Pyron from a Jupyter Lab interface. We have a nice integration, as you see, to visualize the structures. So there we use the, the NGL view package. The Jupyter um, part allows us to, to structure our part, right? so we can make an agenda, what are the topics certain calculations, and finally the analysis, um, as I showed here with a small figure, right? So we really, we come with this one step closer to the lab book that we maybe know from our experimental colleagues, right? So it's really like clear what step by step, what was I doing, and what's basically the result of, of my simulation, right? So it's, again, to, to motivate this, why we call it an IDE, it really should be one solution that you open up and there's clear, how, how did you derive a certain result? And so how does it look in practice? The, the part that we focus on for the development of Pyron is really this kind of idea of rapid prototyping, right? So we would 
do a lot of work where you maybe read the paper in a journal club and we want to reproduce the most uh, important results. And so for us it was important that using Pyron, using Pyron in an interactive way, like you would do on a command line or in a Jupyter notebook, uh, is, is as simple as possible. So we only require a single import, so we import only the project, and from this project object, we derive the other objects. The project can be imagined in a very simple way, like, like a folder in the file system. Right, so I have, a, I have my folder, and then by creating the job object in the sec, uh, third line from the project object, it already knows where the data is stored, right? So the data goes in the folder of the project. The hierarchy is directly there without the user having to define, okay, there's a connection between these objects. By creating them from each other using the factory pattern, I already have this connection. In the same way, I set the structure for my job object, and once I have the structure defined, and I say, okay, this is a couple structure, when I then say, list me all the available interatomic potentials, it obviously knows, okay, if you want only potentials for a job, the couple is defined in the structure, I can already filter by couple, right? So it's the small steps, but that really helps users to make it much easier. And then finally, the interaction with the queuing system. So for us, we, we mainly use templates, and you would just specify which templates to use uh, to, to use for your system and, and how many cores you want, right? So do I want one node, 10 nodes, 500 nodes? You would just specify this. Afterwards, you call run. And then in the background, all this data of like submitting to the cluster, all that part, storing the data, is all handled in the background. So the idea is really, you only define the resources once, right? So the executables, interatomic potential, queuing system, and so on. And then they can be reused in every simulation protocol to really make the simulation protocol focus on the and the, re the, the resources only defined once. So now we can go one step further. So it's a very similar example. Now I basically iterate over the code, right? So there was one, one goal for us is to really be able to try different codes. I think our community as material scientists or I guess scientists in general, we all benefit from trying codes from other people, maybe get some idea there, get um, some other tries there. So we really want to make it simple to iterate over other codes, maybe try different ones, and so the, the interface is, is always the same, or we try to make it as similar as possible. The other part that I want to show you here is um, how we handle data or data aggregation, and then we use the, the MapReduce pattern. So basically, um, what we do is we, we when we, we call this parent table object, um, basically, where basically every row is going to be one job in your project, and then you can define the columns on your own by setting um, functions to the parent table object, right? So for many functions, we have them already predefined, like getting the total energy, getting the volume, but you can also add your own functions. This function basically takes a job object as an input, and then you get an entry in your column as an output. That allows us to very analyze very large data sets quite quickly and build very specific data sets also for machine learning applications or, or so on. And so we iterate over codes and then using MapReduce afterwards to, to aggregate this data. Then some new development that was primarily done during my time at Los Alamos is really addressing this um, large uh, allocation on the upcoming exascale computers, right? So for this, we basically submit a single uh, allocation to the queuing system, maybe 500 nodes, maybe more. Uh, and then within this allocation, we would now submit, uh, distribute the different tasks uh, using Pyron internal structure, right? So we, that's what we do here with the, with the worker class. We define the worker, how many cores it has available, and then all the other uh, jobs are submitted to this worker, and then the worker is taking over the distribution within the allocation. Good. Um, that was basically Pyron a year ago. What we did since then is really focus on this idea of that it's working great on the atomistic side. Can we now extend the principles, right? So this job management can be basically independent. And so we, we split the project a bit. So there's now a Pyron atomistics module and a Pyron base module, and the Pyron base module is only the job management and, and the data storage part without any relation to atomistics part. And we try to make it as easy as possible to integrate new codes, even if you're outside the atomistic simulation people. Um, so we just say you, you only need to write basically a write input function that takes a Python dictionary as input and then writes the output files because that's very code specific. And in the same way, the collect output function takes a directory as output where the output files are located and has to return a Python dictionary. All the rest of the task connecting to the data storage and so on is taken over by the framework. So we, we hope with this, it's really uh, simple to integrate this and hopefully the development that we did on the, the job management side is also beneficial for others. Um, we're very happy about the, the open source contributions, right? So it, in our community it still took a bit until we were allowed to, to release it as open source. There were certain questions raised before, but um, 
yeah, we, we pushed for it, and, and now we have a growing number of, of contributions, starting from Germany, but now also uh, internationally, Russia, Canada, and since I'm in the US, also now um, many contributions from the US. So that's also something, if there's still somebody who is not convinced, I guess here many people are, but I really see that open source made it so much um, more valuable for, for such a uh, software project. So let me talk a bit about applications of Pyron. Um, I brought many applications. I will focus just on one, but let's, let me give you a, a rough overview. Um, one part, we, we heard now a lot about um, machine learning potentials, and they're all trained to DFT data. But what I always find is, is missing a bit in this discussion is this question, how precise is our DFT data? How much does it change if I tune my convergence parameter? So that was also part of my PhD to figure out, okay, how can I define the convergence parameter to achieve a certain precision in, in DFT? And then we talk about melting temperatures for interatomic potentials. We also have some work on the machine learning potentials. Um, what's maybe then more, more interesting is a, the spin space averaging. So before I looked a lot at magnetic materials and there the question is, how do I handle a paramagnetic state where my spin moments are flipping much faster than uh, the, the ionic movements? And one way we found that it was surprisingly efficient is basically running multiple calculations in parallel one for each spin state, and then just during every MG step or optimization step, average the forces over all these uh, different spin configurations. So that's also coupling codes during the runtime is something that we uh, added to Pyron, which makes it very handy to build more complex parts, like the spin spread averaging or, or also the, the thermodynamic integration. Finally, we used the platform for virtual workshops. And now more recently, um, at Los Alamos, we're even looking into this approach of coupling simulation directly to a an experimental robot to then see, okay, how, how much can we accelerate the, the results from a robot with a data that we get to gain from uh, simulation. So let me focus on the melting points because I guess melting is something that's very obvious to, to everybody, right? So what we look at here is um, one, one simulation protocol that we implement in Pyron, and you can find it here on the, in the, the publication. And the idea is um, that the user should only provide the element and the interatomic potential, and then Pyron should do all the rest and in the end, outputs you one melting point where it's certain that it's converged and so on. And you can give an, a guess for the melting point. If you don't provide a guess, we will just use the experimental melting point. So the, the different steps there, we would first heat a bulk sample, then we would freeze half of the structure and continue heating the other half, so that it really becomes like a solid liquid interface. And if it's an interface, after all, right, so if, if both phases form, that's fine. If it doesn't form, right? So if, if we're here at this stage and the whole sample is solid, we have a feedback loop, so it goes back, adjusts the initial guess for the melting point, and reruns the steps before. If already at this first step, that the, the, where we assume it to be bulk, it becomes fully liquid, we know, okay, our initial guess was too high. We adjust the step and again go, have a feedback loop going back. After we have the stable solid liquid interface, we apply a strain along the z direction, so it's orthogonal to our interface. First, do a volume and temperature constraint calculation, then volume and energy constraint, and finally, we have a, a temperature over pressure curve. Then we know, okay, at zero pressure, that's our melting temperature, so we again use this value, put it back in, in the beginning, and run the whole protocol again to see if the XY plane is also relaxed. Um, there were certain challenges there, so one challenge was de uh, in developing a solid liquid detector, so to really see, okay, where, which part is solid, which part is liquid, um, visually, we can nicely see this here, right? So we can directly identify where there's a solid, but we also see that common neighbor analysis, which is a, a common tool used there, uh, has a bit trouble to identify the right ratio. We then coupled it um, with the kernel density score to really see, okay, we can now identify the, the ratio very nicely. So it's 46% uh, uh, is, is solid here. So that's reasonably close to, to the 50-50 part that we are aiming for. The other part that we found was um, we had the formation of voids in, in the liquid phase, in particular for HCP potentials. And so that's what we see here. So we use a, a Voronoi volume to detect if there are any voids forming, because those typically result in um, errors in the pressure over strain curves. And to adjust to that you can believe me that it's, it's fully automated, I iterated over the, the NIST database of interatomic potentials. I, I picked roughly 200 of them. Some of these potentials have multiple elements. So I did 260 melting point calculation. And that's definitely something you don't want to have any, any manual step in the process to do this, right? So let's really iterate over this. The other part that we can learn from this data set is for many elements, we find a spread between the different potentials of up to 1,000 Kelvin, 
right? And so that highlights to us that there's still a long way for comparing the um, results that we have from our potentials directly to experiment. So what the emphasis here is really Pyron allows us to, to upscale the simulation protocols and not only in video calculation, but really these complex protocols. And we aim to, to really make them autonomous, right? So if you're working on a larger scale, maybe you build a finite element model or something, you don't want to care about the details how this calculation is executed. You only want to give this potential, this element, you want to get the result, what is the melting point, to really automate the whole process and, and don't think about any special cases or something like this. Um, what we then do once we have this kind of highly specialized data set, we would like train a machine learning model. So here there's a very simple uh, decision tree. So basically the idea there is can, can we learn the, the melting temperature already from bulk properties? Right? So can we identify bulk properties? If we calculate those, we can already predict uh, the melting point. You see this model here. It already has a nice correlation, but there's a lot of trouble in particular with the lower temperature melting. So that's still something we'll be looking into and, and working on. But this, this goal of being able to, to calculate a targeted database for specific properties, that's really, I guess, one of the strengths of our solution. So now coming to the next step, right? So I, now I have new results, I, I gathered everything, I want to publish my workflow. And that's what, what I started with, right? So how can we motivate this? And as already said nicely in the introduction, um, that there was a lot of work done in the ContaForge community. Many packages on the general Python side were already in there. What we then did, we, com or may, 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 mainly I, I contributed roughly 400 packages to this community with a specific focus on material science. And that really uh, kicked off a, a lot of movement. I guess by now, many of the new developments within like t uh, six to 12 months are also released on Conda Forge. And that makes it very easy to uh, reach this goal of, of trying new codes and playing around with them. And I guess I don't have to motivate Conda Forge here. Most of you um, know it and, and the advantage of having like a pre-compiled executable that you can try and play around with. Obviously, if you go to high performance computers, you still want to recompile it if you do millions of calculations, but just to try a new code, play around with it, I think Conda Forge is amazing. Yeah, simplify the distribution. So we now have basically four levels if I have a simulation protocol, starting with this high level where the users only give the potential and the, the element, then the scientific level, which we try to do in the Jupyter Notebook, where we say, okay, we, we define the, um, the individual steps that are required to reach a certain result. Then we use Pyron as our technical level to handle the job management, communication with the queuing system, data management, so the storage and, and the, Python inter uh, the, the interface to the simulation codes, and then finally, Conda Forge to, to distribute the packages and the underlying software. Um, so, so you can find this here. So we have a, a publication template. So we encourage everybody who's using our software to, to do a publication to also publish the Jupyter Notebooks. And um, we provide this environment so you can include your, your Conda environment. You can also include additional files that you created for Pyron, right? So additional classes that you maybe defined results or also parameter databases. And it's then published using the, the Continuous integration from, from GitHub. So it's rendered as a Jupyter book, so, so accessible as a website. We also have an integration with my binder, so you can directly try the notebook. And for those who are curious, you can try out the, the melting point notebook um, on our GitHub. So that's Pyron underscore melting point um, to, to just play around with the notebook and see how we do it. Yeah, so we, we hope to really cover the whole life cycle from having an idea, writing the notebook, and then publishing it as well right next to the scientific papers. And maybe one, one short part about the, the interatomic potentials. So I guess we had many great talks this, uh, this morning. What I'm always wondering is, is how, what would happen if I take the best from one potential and combine it with the best from another, right? So I want to really play around. I want to have all the different kind of descriptors, right? So moment tensor potentials, snap potentials, EAM. So those are more focused on solids, but like have all the uh, descriptors available and then want to, to couple them all with different kind of of fitting parts, right? So maybe I want to use a neural network, maybe I want to use a Gaussian process or simply a linear model to be able to couple them. And as it's so often, right, so we, we have these ideas, we want to do them, but we never have the time. So what we did was basically we said, okay, we just promised a workshop, we invite many people, then we have some pressure to really do it and, and realize it. And then after the workshop was done and we had like a week of sleep, we looked back, okay, how, how did this happen, right? So how did we get there? And when looking back, right, so it was one and a half months that we had to realize all this. We spent the first month getting the codes into Condor. It was a bit difficult because we still had to work on the interfaces of getting the potentials 
also then running in our uh, LAMPS code, so that's uh, the MD code that we were using. Afterwards, we spent a week to get the wrappers in, into Pyron. Okay. Uh, and finally, another week to get the notebooks done. Right? So it's really what I want to emphasize with this is the ability of doing this rapid prototyping. Right? Really going from an idea to running the workshop. Two days later, we run the workshop for two days. It was two half days. And I was very happy to meet people that were participating virtually in our workshop now here at the conference. So it was really amazing. So that I try to emphasize with this is really this idea of, of rapid prototyping. Fitting potential is just one application. I don't want to claim that we have any, any advanced skills in this. But going from like an idea to really releasing it as a part where others can participate, that I guess is one of the strong points of Pyron. So with this, I come to the summary. I hope I was able to convince you by introducing the, the Pyron objects, we can split the technical and the scientific complexity. To, for the user, it's really all inside one framework, just accessing accessible via JupyterLab. And I showed you some applications, like the calculation of the melting points, to discover previously unknown correlations. We're building a specialized data set and then applying machine learning to filter out um, correlations there. Obviously, this is not only my work. There are many people involved, right? So there's a big group at the Max Planck Institute for Eisenforschung, and we're now building up a group at Los Anamos. We also have other collaborators, and we're very happy about the funding sources, in particular, at the moment, the ECP project, so the Exascale project, uh, to su support this and ex uh, fund us. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Great talk. Um, any questions? So you've got a lot of components up here. Are you able to use, do you have to use all of it in order to use any of it? Or can you use pieces of it effectively? Yes. So yeah, very good question. I guess it's one of the challenges, right? So we were in the lucky situation that we could design a solution for one work group, and that's how it developed. Um, we now did the split of like the, the Pyron base part, right? So you don't have to use our way how we realize the atomistic part. You can just use the workflow manager and the data storage. We release certain parts of like how we interface with the queuing system as a separate part or our specific interface with the LAMPS code as a, a separate package. But that's still work in progress, right? So for us, it's really a challenge how to, how to split a bigger project to make it maintainable. Um, so if there's somebody who wants to discuss about this, I would be very interested. Uh, that's still one challenge, yeah. I'm happy to, but I don't have a real answer. So you can use it. You can use only the workflow component. But um, yeah, the splitting is still a work in progress. Um, any other questions? The Jupyter Notebook integration for job management is super cool. How do you deal with like the asynchronous nature that you get from Jupyter Notebook? Like, it doesn't execute the other cells. And you can close your laptop and walk away, and it's, the server's over there. Yeah. How is that handled? So the, the fundamental part is the, the, the serialization of our objects. So basically, when you, when you run your notebook up to the step where it submits to the queuing system, it would, would basically stop there and say, OK, I submitted this calculation. The next steps are not possible. You c shut down your notebook. And if you open the notebook again, you lost the cache of, cache of, your, of your Jupyter notebook. But when you execute it again, based on defining the name and, and the, the project, we can reload the same object. Right? So we see, OK, these objects are already done. There are maybe some more objects I want to now submit to the queuing system. So at the moment, so the one way to do it would be always to, to iterate my notebook and always run, run the steps. What we do in a, in a high performance cluster would be more we, we can also submit the whole notebook to the queuing system. And um, there we basically use the, the NB convert function from Jupyter Notebooks. So then the notebook is running basically at uh, uh, the head node of, of my allocation. And therefore, there would be no reloading. It would be just waiting until the jobs are done. That, that was a great talk. I had a question about the uh, distributed computing aspect. Uh, is that using a uh, library like Dask, or do you have your own proprietary implementation? And also, is the execution happening as uh, Docker containers, or are you running like pure Python code? OK. Thank you. So, so for, for the first part, we, we mainly use the Slurm queuing system. Right? So being, being on the, the Exascale part, so we, we um, yeah, ma mainly the Slurm queuing system, we run one job per node, and we, inside the, the big allocation, so if I have 500 nodes in my allocation, I run multiple S run commands to, to access the node directly via the Slurm interface. And the, the reason why we don't use Dusk was um, we weren't able to figure out how to run, like because of what we run underneath are like this, these old Fortran codes, right? So which 
not only use one thread, but maybe use a whole node. Um, we weren't able to handle this on, on the Dask side, right? So if I, have an, if I want to call a process which is outside of Python, which requires more than one rank, um, that was something where we struggled with on the Dask side. But I'm, I'm very happy to learn more there, right? So they were, we, we looked like it uh, five years ago, so I'm, I'm very, very sure that they advanced, but we mainly rely on the Slurm interface at the moment. And for the second part, um, having all our dependencies in Conda, we can definitely build Docker containers, and for workshops, we use Docker containers. For the HPC clusters, we still um, yeah, run on bare metal, just for the performance and the integration with the GPUs. There was, uh, yeah, we, we had some limitations there with the virtualization of the clusters, so currently it's just bare metal. Questions? Um, okay, so we're gonna break now, and I think we're back at like 325, or?